from the Heritage Foundation, I'm Tim Desher, and this is Heritage Explains. When we talk about the justice system, we typically think about judges, and for good reason. They have tremendous power. But what about other parts of the justice system? What about district attorneys? The way the system works is that judges hear the cases and deliver the opinions. But district attorneys typically decide what cases to even bring before the judge. According to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, there are over 2,300 district attorneys in the U.S., all wielding tremendous power to decide what crimes to prosecute, what penalties to push for, and maybe most importantly, what crimes not to prosecute. They are the truest reflection of how a locality views justice. If you were paying attention to the news a couple weeks ago, you might have caught this, well, awkward exchange on the Fox News channel between Newt Gingrich, Harris Faulkner, and Melissa Francis discussing the costs of the recent damage from the riots. The number one problem in almost all these cities is George Soros elected left-wing anti-police pro-criminal district attorneys who refuse to pe keep people locked up. Progressive district attorneys are anti-police pro-criminal and overwhelmingly elected with George Soros's money, and they're a major cause of the violence we're seeing because they keep putting the violent criminals back on the street. I'm not sure we need to bring George get Soros into this. <laughs> I was going to say you get the last word, he Speaker. <laughs> he, he, he paid for it. I mean, why can't we discuss the fact that millions no, of he dollars didn't. he spent? I, I agree with Melissa. George people. Soros doesn't need to be a part of this conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's verboten. All right, we're good. Okay, we're going to move on. Who, boy. Awkward indeed. But why not bring George Soros into this? It's apparent that Soros is indeed funding an effort to support district attorney candidates who want to fundamentally change how district attorneys function. Enter the Justice and Public Safety PAC and its chair, Whitney Timas. We are looking for challengers who are interested in truly changing their offices once elected. So we're looking for forward-thinking, reform-minded prosecutors. Now, these are folks who are more li likely to be focused on creating policy that would result in reducing unnecessary confinement, right? Or prioritizing treatment over incarceration or uh, looking for diversion, opportunities to divert people out of the system or, or seeking lesser charges for, for nonviolent offenses, for example, um, holding police officers accountable. According to OpenSecrets.org, this group has and is funding several district attorney campaigns in cities big and small around America and speaks openly about their intentions to use money George Soros donates to replace traditional DAs with so-called reform-minded DAs. They claim they're doing this for greater justice and more safety. But as we've seen with the recent riots, Many of these cities that have been damaged the most have DAs who have either been supported by Soros-type groups or they're of the same judicial philosophy. So what would our justice system look like if far-left DAs transformed it toward more lenient and compassionate outcomes? Or challenged laws they didn't agree with by declining to even bring charges? What is the connection between current unrest in our cities and funding from people like George Soros? And what do they have to gain? 
Now, I don't think there's any question that, that all of these things are, are part of a, some coordinated effort. I don't think you have to be a conspiracy theorist or, or wear a, a, a tinfoil hat to think, you know, something is afoot here. Every night we have buildings being burned down and there's no, there doesn't seem to be any real end in sight and there doesn't seem to be any idea as to how we're going to get out of this right now. Jason Johnson is a friend of the Heritage Foundation and the president of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. On this episode, he tells the story of six prominent cities that have recently switched to so-called reform district attorneys. The results are chilling, and we'll get into those results right after this short break. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle. If you're looking for a way to keep up with the news that matters, the Daily Signal podcast brings you the top news of the day. Host Rachel Del Judas, Kate Trinko, Rob Bluey, and myself, Virginia Allen, bring you headlines and interviews with lawmakers, authors, and conservative activists. If you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast, available every weekday morning. prosecutorial malpractice, progressive prosecutors, public safety, and felony outcomes. That's the big report. And I'm going to tell you what, folks, it's not that long. It's very easy to understand and, and grab on to the insane stuff that they are finding right now with what's happening in, in, in certain cities around America. So I'm going to link to it. Please log on uh, and, and look at it. But, but in the report, Jason, you say district attorneys wield enormous power and influence over the operation of the criminal justice system. And you've seen that system mm. from almost every angle at this point. Set the stage for us. Explain the role of a district attorney. Yeah. So every every county in in America and at every city that's separate from a county has an elected head of their, you know, whether they're called a district attorney, a state's attorney, prosecutor, whatever. There is this role, and it's it's elected yeah. uh, that has enormous power, enormous discretion in our criminal justice system. So 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 many people think when they think of law enforcement or criminal justice, they think about cops, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the most visible part sort of prototypical idea of what criminal justice, but, it, but really it's just the front door. Hmm. The cops are the ones who investigate crime, who are a visible presence in the community to, to provide for the immediate public safety, to respond to 911 calls, to investigate crime, to identify who's committed crimes, in many cases to charge people with criminal offenses when there's evidence. Um, but what happens after that is the case gets handed off to this prosecutor's office, and that's led by this elected person. And historically, the elections of those people have been kind of under the radar. Like it's not, it's not the top of the ticket. It's right. not, it's not what you hear a lot about. I'm trying to think about the last <laughs> district attorney that I voted for, and I can't remember. You don't, yeah. Most people, it's just sort of a party line vote. Whoever gets the nomination for their party, that's if they, they might not know the name, or maybe they know the name, but they don't quite understand what the person does. Um, f- f- in terms of the the amount of money needed to raise to run for one of these positions, it's it's much less than you would for the chief executive of the jurisdiction, so for the mayor or the county executive or whatever. It's it's typically m- a much um, less expensive office to win um, in terms of fundraising. Um, it, people in big cities, they, they tend to know who their, you know, state's attorney or district attorney is just because, you know, they get more airtime on the news and things like that. But most other places, it, it kind of flies under the radar. So you talk about um, progressive district attorneys or as, as we come to know, reformers, as you say, reform district attorneys. How, how do reform DAs differ from uh, a normal DA, I guess? Yeah. So if you watch, uh, you know, if you watch uh, Law and Order or any of those shows that tend to focus on the work of district attorneys or prosecutors, you know, the the traditional mold for for that office uh, is one of crime fighting. You know, it's one of using the criminal justice system to bring justice to victims. Their job was really to their main focus. Traditionally, prosecutors hold people accountable when they commit a criminal offense to do it in the interest of justice, to do it to, you know, help victims to recover from having been victimized. Now, what we're seeing in these jurisdictions that have elected these progressive 
social justice oriented prosecutors, much different backgrounds. So they 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 tend to come to their office as either having been civil rights lawyers, so suing law enforcement, like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. That's how he was never a prosecutor, was never involved in the criminal justice system other than suing the police department, which he did over 75 times. Wow. So, so you can see the difference in philosophy and where they come, they come, um, you know, how they approach their job. Typically, former defense attorneys, sometimes former public defenders, civil rights lawyers, sometimes just, you know, private corporate uh, work, not really involved in the system until they take that job. We're going to get into the why later, but I want to focus a little bit on the six cities that you mm-hmm. focused on in the report. It was Baltimore, San Antonio, Chicago. Philadelphia, Dallas, and St. Louis. I'll tell you what, I looked at this and some of these stats are chilling. I mean, it's it's very incredible. This is such a um, important thing to point out. So just if you could just go over some of the top line trends that you found mm. throughout these cities who have embraced these progressive district attorneys. We entered this with sort of a hypothesis that you know, we knew we knew the cities, and we, we certainly could have looked at other cities. Those aren't the only cities that have progressive social justice prosecutors that have been elected in the last few years. But sure. you know, we chose the jurisdictions on a, for a lot of different reasons. One one is uh, they had the, these are these are uh, these six prosecutors are very vocal about their uh, embrace that they embrace this social justice philosophy. They're very, I mean, it's it's how it's how they campaign. They did not really try to hide what they were going to do when they when they won office. So it was not a secret. We also wanted to be able to get the data that we needed to conduct the analysis. So we, we, we chose places where we felt we would be able to get adequate data through public sources. We had to make FOIA requests and all that. But we also want, I'm sure you're going to ask more about this later, but we also want to include at least a couple jurisdictions where the prosecutor had received massive amounts of funding from George Soros. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in yes. order to get elected. Preview of coming attractions, <laughs> folks. Stay tuned. Basically, what we learned, I mean, we also know in each of these jurisdictions, crime is increasing in some cases dramatically in the last several years. And the crime increases happen to line up with the election of these new prosecutors. So, for example, in Baltimore, since Marilyn Mosby took office in, in, in 2015, you know, if you just look at the crime stats, and, and part of it has to do with the riots that took place in 2015, but of course, Marilyn Mosby had a lot to do with. The, the aftermath of those riots. Sure. Homicides up 65%, carjackings up like 270%. Wow. You know, massive increases in crime. And we saw increases in all of these jurisdictions that, that roughly coincides with this, this new uh, a, a social justice prosecutor taking office. But we'll, just an increase, obviously, that's, that's correlation without necessary causation. So right. we wanted to also look at how has the office performed? How has the prosecutor's office performed since this? elected head took office. Yeah. And in each case, massive increases in dropped and lost cases by the prosecutor's office, mm-hmm. massive increases like, for example, in, in, in Baltimore, uh, for people illegally carrying firearms. Now, I'm not talking about legally people you know, with, a, with a permit or whatever carrying. I'm not talking about people just with firearms in their homes. I'm talking about people in the street illegally carrying firearms, many of whom uh, with felony prior felony convictions, just not being held accountable at all. And that there shouldn't be any question why there's so many shootings and why there's so many murders if no one is accountable for anything really right. in the city. Yeah. yeah. And and things like drug charges, I'm sure, are just are, are going by the wayside. And, and we all know these things lend to more crime and more instability in our neighborhoods. And and that's part of the reason why this report is, is so important to point this out. Um so this movement started, you said Marilyn Mosby was elected in 2015. Yeah. So this is fairly a recent movement yeah. Yeah, it of is. funding these races and, and, and pushing for these progressive-minded DAs. Very, it's very recent. And probably they're playing off of some of the social unrest that, that, that's happening, using that as a kind of a, a wedge to get in, do you suspect? Uh, yeah, and, and certainly that'll happen more in, in the future. Um, uh, Chaz Boudin is a, is a newly elected uh, prosecutor in, in San Francisco, and of course, you know San Francisco is a, is a very, very, yeah. <laughs> very far left. Right. But he is even even is considered extremely left, even for San Francisco. And you, you're just going to see this happen in, in almost every urban area, not and, and even in the suburbs. You know, Fairfax County, Virginia, which is not you know it is a it is a blue county, but it's a, it's in Virginia. It's not a city. 
Um, and they recently elected a, a very, very outspoken uh, social justice prosecutor. So it's not just the cities. I mean, that's that's where it started, but it's it's it is spreading and it's coming to a suburb near you. <laughs> yeah. You uh, you say in the report that tens of millions of dollars are being funneled into these district attorney races with the goal of transforming the criminal justice system towards more lenient and compassionate outcomes, lenient and compassionate outcomes. That sounds kind of nice, Jason. Really, really nice kind of utopian society. I really like that. But we all know, as you said, that there's an increase of crime. There's an increase in dropped cases. There's an increase in in just a, a lack of accountability to crimes. So, you know, with these millions of dollars going in, what what do these wealthy donors like George Soros have to gain from more lenient and compassionate outcomes? You know, you know that's the million dollar question, and that, that's a. The, it's just it, it's unclear to me what the ultimate end game is here. But I mean, I think the intermediate step is clear that it, it it's going to increase violence, disorder, and chaos in the cities in particular, and and again spreading to the suburbs. The why, the why is that advantageous for a guy like George Soros to do? I, someone else is going to probably have to answer that question. I, He's I probably still going to have security, though. He, you know, he <laughs> can imagine. he can pay for security detail, I'm sure. But but you know, you and I might yeah. have a hard time uh, paying for that yeah. every day. But but yeah. yeah. So, I so but what does it look like? F- you know what what do we lose from it? Uh, security, safety. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, predictable. Um, you know, for, for businesses, for people who just want to live and raise a family in, in comfort and safety, uh, not not necessarily having that because there's not, you know, in these jurisdictions, if you just look at it, it's like drugs is one example, but there, there are many others. And in, in the case of, of Dallas, Dallas uh, district attorney has announced he won't prosecute theft under $750. So if you commit a theft, you steal something worth $650 or $700, you're not going to be prosecuted. So he's basically legalized stealing up to $750. And and if you think about that, I mean, what are the consequences of that? Well, I don't know. I mean, they, they're, they're, uh, it would take you days to figure out what the, what the possible consequences of that. With respect to drugs, you know, um, Marilyn Mosby has said that she's not going to prosecute any marijuana cases in Baltimore City now? Marijuana is still illegal in, in Maryland. Um, it's it's uh, it's medical marijuana, I think, is legal, but recreational is not. Yeah. And it doesn't matter the amount. She's had cases where people have had uh, been found with kilos of marijuana, and and they they won't prosecute those cases. So the violence associated with drug trade is no different for marijuana than it is for any other substance: cocaine, heroin, meth, you name it. As you're talking, I, I just had had this thought, and, and maybe to some people it says, oh, duh, T- Tim, you should have thought of that before. But, you know, this all goes to, especially in the case of marijuana, no, you know, a lot of people believe that marijuana should be legal. And the problem is, is that they can't get it through the mm-hmm. legislator, the right. body that's yeah. supposed to, and then get the governor to sign it. You know, there's a Correct. process for legalizing yeah. things. That, that's we kinda, have the power to do right. that. And, yeah. and these races I'm picking up on is if they don't get what they want through the proper way, they're going to do it through another way. They're going to corrupt another way. And that is extremely dangerous. Well, it it's really throws a curveball to the system when you can have a singular elected person like a, like a prosecutor mm. that can completely wipe out the other branches of government simply by an exercise of discretion and saying, you know what? I'm going to exercise my discretion and I'm not enforcing this law, whether it's drugs or it's theft or it's trespassing or you name it, where a singularly elected individual can just say, yeah, I understand the legislature wants this to be illegal, but guess what? I'm the one charged with enforcing it and I'm not going to enforce it. And the ripple effect from that is uh, really, really concerning. I mean, and with Marxist ideals in, in, in you know, left wing thought. I mean, you can see how there's no respect for private property. You can see how there's no respect for individual liberty, individual rights. And so a prosecutor has no problem letting that all fall to the wayside by letting crimes like that go. Let's let's talk a little bit more focusing on today with riots and out of control protests. um, You know, 
we begin to hear about coordinated and organized efforts like uh, the bail project where you know celebrities are saying donate to the bail project and we can get these people out of jail who have been put there for protesting or you know the uh, black lives matter the people's budget where they want to divert funds away from police toward other caring uh Things where, you know, defund the police, basically. Um, and now with this effort with the DAs, judges, you know, this looks really coordinated. Can you is, is there a way to connect the dots? Are they in touch with each other doing this or is this just some sort of hurricane that's coming together at the right time? No, I don't think there's any question that, that all of these things are, are part of a some coordinated effort. I don't think you have to be a conspiracy theorist or or wear a, a, a tinfoil hat to think, <laughs> you know, Something is afoot here, and, and I don't. I, maybe I'm not smart enough to be able to connect the dots myself. But you know, the whole purpose for us kicking off this work is that it was an observation we made. Yeah. You know, we began this well before the death of George Floyd. I mean, this yeah. this work was been has been in progress before that. But since then, I mean, it's, everything has gone into hyper speed. I mean, everything that you're talking about, mm. where it's just. There's this move to abolish or defund police. There's a move to um, a strong move, really, that's taken hold to move away from any form of cash bail or in, in situations where there is cash bail that celebrities and others are raising money to cover it. Um, look, you know, I mean, there, you know, uh, most of our system is imperfect. It's the best system in the world, but it, mm-hmm. it um, there's no part of our system that can't be tinkered with and made better. But this wholesale throw the baby out with the bathwater idea um, that, that really many of these ideas that have come up that you, you just hit on are going to be devastating to so much of American life um, in, in ways that I don't think we can even really consider right now. Just the threat to public safety, the threat to law and order, the threat to security, um, the instability and chaos that we were, we're already seeing it play out in the streets and the lack of accountability for the people who are engaged in it. I mean, we have cops being shot. Every night we have buildings being burned down and there's no, there doesn't seem to be any real end in sight and there doesn't seem to be any idea as to how we're going to get out of this right now. Yeah. Who's our George Soros that's going to fund the opposite direction of where he's going? You know, uh, uh, you know, you have this group Back the Blue, which is a great thing, supporting police officers. Um, Heritage Action, our our um, sister organization, you know, they have No Police, No Peace. That's a campaign going on to raise awareness of, of what's, you know. Um, you know, how how do we even begin yeah. to to look, uh, to, to push back or even um, make a dent in what's been going on? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to win sort of, uh, the middle people who are mm. of goodwill, who are open minded, who maybe right now are subject to the influence of what they're seeing on some of the cable news networks, and they believe, um, you know, the cops are evil or they should be defined. I mean, these are I'm talking about people who are generally reasonable and rational, but they've been led down this road, mm. and the way to push back is p- to provide facts and to try to hope those facts take hold. Unfortunately, in our age of social media, facts are less important, I think, than they've ever been. Facts and evidence are really less important. You know, if you if you if you go onto Twitter and just look at what happens on Twitter, um, you really get uh, there's there's a strong cancel culture where when you try to come forward with facts and evidence, you just get completely rejected. Um, You know, Charles Barkley Hmm. uh, just commented recently and he's not the first one to do this uh, on the Breonna Taylor case where he tried to offer some some actual facts into the conversation. Hmm. And uh, it, it seems like he's going to be canceled for doing that. You know, he, there's just so much hate and vitriol when you just try to offer some facts for consideration. So, But I say all that to say that we have got to be in a place where we can inject facts into the conversation and not be canceled and not be shot down and, and start to win the middle back where reasonable, rational people – are going to start to say, you know, something is going on here that we really need to sort of turn around. I don't know, Jason, if there's one person that cannot be canceled, I think Charles Barkley might be the maybe the only one that would uh, that would stand up against cancellation. (laughs) So the report is prosecutorial malpractice, progressive prosecutors, public safety and felony outcomes. That's the report that came from you and your organization, Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. I also want to just put in a plug for the other work that you do there. There's a couple of videos that you have on your website that I watched, and a couple of those stories of some of these police officers who were 
falsely accused of, you know, whatever, their lives were destroyed. And you guys came to their defense. You guys supported them with resources, with lawyers, with all sorts of things to give them some semblance of their life back. And Jason, it's truly incredible, remarkable, and inspiring. Thanks, Tim. You know, um, that's what we've been doing for over 26 years now at the Legal Defense Fund. Our organization was started by some former Reagan administration people, including, you know, Al Regnery and mm. and uh, Ed Meese, who's been involved uh, from from the very beginning, who's still on our board of directors. You know, really with the idea of, as how it started, is that there's some cops that are being charged, that are being targeted for political reasons, really, and they have nowhere to turn for help. These Their criminal defense costs $100,000, $200,000 when they're charged with these really serious crimes like homicide or murder. And uh, that's what we do. We've been very successful being able to raise funds to defend these cops. But even even more than that, I mean, that's still our core mission. And we and unfortunately, Tim, you know, business has never been better. I, I get contacted at least once a week by some cop somewhere in America who has been charged with with a crime. Now, we don't take every case. You know, we right. we're very careful about the cases that we accept. Only want cases where there's the really bona fide cases where these cops are being singled out for just for being cops and politically prosecuted. But unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of this, and the, the work isn't really going to end. Jason, thank you so much for all you're doing. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for the, for talking with us this week, and we'll uh, we'll see you down the road. Great, thanks for having me, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Heritage Explains. I'm going to go ahead and link to Jason's report, as well as some of the other resources that we talked about that the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund is producing. As always, we love it when you rate us. We love it when you send us comments. We love it when you send us emails at managingeditor@heritage.org, And we love knowing that we're going to be back next week with a brand new episode. We'll see you then. Heritage Explains is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Desher, with editing by John Pop.